call. Again, thank you all for joining and hope you're having a great afternoon. Uh, really excited to catch up with you all and talk about the meetings that are lying ahead in our subcommittee process. Commissioner Schwinn is on uh, to give us some updates and answer any questions you might have. Lots of good stuff continues to happen, and I know that you all are experiencing that as well. So, Commissioner, I will turn it over to you, ma'am, to get us started. Great. Thank you, Chelsea. Happy 2022. Um, we are we are in the new year, and I think um, it's one of those things where I was like, are we only 12 days in? But we are. So um, it's been an exciting start to the year, of course. A couple of things, and I want to make sure to actually open this up to more conversation, discussion, questions that are coming up. Uh, the big news is obviously that the draft framework came out yesterday. I want to be able to walk through what this is and what this is not. Um, and then also kind of connect that to the more legislative process that may occur. Um, and so first and foremost, the draft proposal is similar to what we talked about over break. It is trying to condense and consolidate the draft recommendations so far. I think what we've heard from the public is we're, we've been able to give this feedback. We kind of want to see what it would look like. So it's taking that deck that we had um, that kind of walk through the formula and saying, okay, great. The next level is to say, here's what might make it in a potential hypothetical formula once that we get to that space. Um, lots of comments so far, even um, I was checking them overnight and, and uh, they were coming at all hours of the evening, but a lot of people I think have been saying, it's really helpful to have something I can respond to and say, yes, that resonates. Um, even if it's just to affirm that that is the right direction. So we've had a lot of people say we're excited to see students with disabilities or English learners or um, low income, all of those different components. I think lots of conversation around rurality and sparsity have also come up. And so again, um, this next phase is to try to get more public feedback on very specific components as opposed to just trying to consolidate a group of ideas. The idea now is that we'll have that public feedback um, for the next week. So um, due by Tuesday, we've extended that deadline, of course, um, and we will send that in chunks. I think Chelsea sent that out yesterday that you'll have one chunk and you'll get that along the way so that as feedback is coming in, you're getting it in more real time to be able to consider that for your next week's meeting. Um, and next week's meeting for some of you, there's a little bit of a different space that folks are on. Some of you have gotten to the place where you're you're pretty done with your recommendations. That's what it says in your document that you want to move into policy. So you'll have next week to either finish your recommendations based on public feedback and then move into policy. I mean, we'll have some policy proposals that we'll send this <coughs> week to consider. And then your last meeting the week after is just ideally on policy and any final, final, final recommendations you might have for formula. Uh, so that's just a picture of kind of where we're going with the process so far. Again, we've got a draft framework of ideas um, that have come in kind of what those it's essentially the the list that gets us a little bit tighter. Want to get feedback on that. Want you all to get your final recommendations as, as a result of that and then start to think about any policy considerations that will come in. A few things on that draft framework. Number one, there is no scenario where there will be dollars attached to anything until the governor gives a state of the state address and a proposed budget if he decides to move forward with a legislative package. So remember, he hasn't said one way or another, this is an engagement process. We we're trying to come up with some really great ideas and a proposal for him to consider, the steering committee to consider um, if they wanna move forward. If he were to do that, I know we've gotten a couple questions um, from folks. Most people seem to understand kind of that process, but wanna be super clear that we aren't gonna be in a position to attach any dollars to any framework until there's a decision to move forward and the governor announces a budget. Both of those things would need to happen. Um, I think uh, maybe some people and, and some people definitely not would want me to do that personally. That is not within my locus of control or the departments to, to put a number on anything. Um, uh, maybe some people wish I could. Um, some people might say no, no, thank you. But uh, it is it is absolutely the, the prerogative of the governor to propose a budget and then the General Assembly to um, make decisions on that budget um, and appropriate accordingly. And, and certainly other bills and things. And so um, we are still in active conversations about a potential legislative proposal. Again, this is going to really drive from the public comment. Um, and that is something that uh, we, we wanna make sure we are um, being very, very clear about. So 
that's that's where we are with the process. Again, it's final recommendations and it is policy uh, considerations. We will send out some policy considerations. We really need your feedback on and then other things you absolutely are welcome to include. Um, really want to encourage you all to talk to your communities and get as much feedback as possible. Um, it's been exciting to see the consistency across each of the 18 subcommittees um, in terms of what we're seeing. Uh, there wasn't a lot of disagreement. There were some things that were maybe specific to one or the other, but the idea that we have to think about RTI and career counseling, college and career counseling, nurses um, and school counselors and advisors, the idea that we need to have funding that really supports our students with disabilities, our students in low income communities, our students who are learning English, our gifted students, lots of feedback on dyslexia. Um, and I think that has been also really powerful to kind of include some of those pieces. And then of course, RTI too, for those of you who are more immersed in the jargon, um, that, that has come up quite a bit. And so I think we've, um, frankly, the feedback so far has been really, really positive. Um, and I'm, I, I'm very encouraged uh, by the consistency across, across your subcommittees. So that's kind of where we are process wise. Um, I wanna just do one more note uh, specific to, um, the other side of it, which is going to be uh, the additional support, feedback, et cetera. Uh, a number of you have submitted requests for additional either information, feedback, documents, et cetera, from experts. Those have been provided. All are publicly posted. So we are in a good place there. Um, as I talked about last time, we also have a state procurement process for any kind of experts that might support and inform the process overall. Um, those of you in government know the government process and we are following all of those all of those various rules and policies. Um, and so when those procurements are executed, we will then be able to communicate about them. But until they're executed, we aren't actually allowed to talk about them. So we do have one um, that is is going to launch this week and we'll be able to connect you with any expert. Um, if you have questions or specific things that you need, continue to email those and we will continue to go get the resource and then provide it in writing um, to your subcommittee. Again, we wanna make sure everything is documented online and publicly available, similar to the comments that you got. And we, we gave some feedback back on the Education Commission of the States or SREB. Um, we've had a number of requests. We'll continue to post those publicly. Um, those are, that's kind of where we are with that space. Encourage you to continue to send questions. Um, we certainly wanna make sure you have all the information that you need. Uh, and then from a timeline perspective, again, um, State of the state is on January 31st. Um, decisions about kind of direction and how we're moving forward will happen obviously by that time. Um, and uh, next week, again, final recommendations policy week after, ideally focusing as much on policy as possible. And then uh, we will move into whatever that next phase might be. Uh, I do want to say just on a personal note, because I've read all of your recommendations in real time and continue to read all of the comments that are coming in. It's really exciting and it's really good. Um, and and I, it's, it always feels really nice when people are focused so much on students and what's best for students. And there is agreement in large part on a number of things across the state so that we don't have to say, well, in West Tennessee, they really want this, but in East Tennessee, they really want that educators and parents and superintendents and advocates and community members and business leaders and all of you, you are saying the same things. And I think that that paints a really strong picture of what is possible, um, how we can create a funding formula that is strategic and ensures that we are investing in kids mm -hmm. and that we are keeping our students front of mind. And that has just, it's been very clear and come through uh, just beautifully in all of your conversations. And I've been very um, proud to be able to watch that and very excited. Um, I will say I went online and showed my folks over the holiday break, even a couple of your subcommittees, because I was just so excited about it. I don't know if they were as excited about it as, as I was, um, but they certainly um, dealt with me showing that. So uh, that is how that is how great I think the work has been. And I uh, just wanted to say again, thank you. I know it's been hours of time um, for all of you on top of everything else you're doing, but this was a big step for us yesterday, putting that out. Um, and I think the feedback that you're gonna review over the next week is the second really big part of the process um, before any kind of final decisions are made about direction. So I'm gonna pause there uh, and just see if there are any questions. I want this to be more of an open conversation. So anything that you need, we're able to address today. Is that you? 
Uh, Director Starnes, is that you? I couldn't tell. I see Director Starnes and Director Horrell. I'm not sure which of you um, had a question. I do have a question, but uh, sure. Ted, if you want to go ahead first, I'll follow you. Well, that was kind. I, I, I'll go ahead and take it then. I did have a question, and I and I uh, I know you can't put dollar signs on it, but I I, I do get feedback about I think the governor's messaging, and, and I know we've started with the premise that no district is going to get less dollars. Is at least is one of the things I've been using to to share about this process. Um, the governor has I feel like had begun to say recently this isn't about more dollars. It's about reallocation of dollars. And I know at least in our committee, and if the committees are the same, almost everything we talk about has to do with having more dollars available to do more things or do the things we're doing better. So I'm I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around, and I've had some questions from my board members. What, what does that look like if the governor's saying this is really about reallocation, but no one's getting less dollars? I don't, I don't, I guess logically, I can't think of how you would do that without putting in more dollars. So is there, how, how do we, how do we handle that kind of questioning, I guess? Yeah, that, I think that's a, a really, really um, important question and comment, and I appreciate you bringing that up on the start. So I think there, there are two different messages that I would, I would share there. So I think one is around um, the actual formula construction, and I think the governor's been clear, um, and I, I, I hope that that translates um, and continues to translate that we really want to focus on having a strategic formula and that the way in which um, money is invested in public schools in the state that there is clarity, transparency, accountability, and people understand the return on those investments. I think that's been really important for the General Assembly. I think that is important for the general public. And I know you all, especially the super, I see all three of the superintendents on the call today. Um, you all know that and, and do that really well. And I think it's uh, going to continue to be important. But one of the biggest points is from the governor, especially, and, and I, I certainly agree that we have to make sure that whatever the new formula is, it is strategic and it is aligned to those expectations. Separately, there is a conversation about how much money it will take um, to inform the work of our subcommittees and this new formula. Those are slightly separate. And so I think when the governor is speaking, he's talking about a strategic investment and making sure the formula is strategic and that any amount of money that that will take will be something that he will look at once we have a final proposal. So I don't think there's a suggestion that we are just going to reallocate the existing funding. I think what he's saying is that we wanna make sure that when we ask for more money in public education, there is a really strong amount of confidence that that money is going where it is intended and it is prioritizing the things that Tennessee wants prioritized. Um, we will know um, if we move forward with the legislative package, he would announce at the state of the state um, what that what that amount would be. But again, we're we're seeing um, based on the kind of the next couple of weeks um, whether he would put something forward and then how much money he would put towards that. That is clarifying. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, and this is on the document, the draft document that came out yesterday. Yes, sir. On, on page two. OK. It taught under weights for poverty and concentrated concentrated poverty mm -hmm. as direct certification. And I know our committee talked about that at length. Uh, we feel like students, a lot of students with the quote working poor are missed there and they still have the same issues that a student who's direct certified would have. Mm -hmm. But then when we look at title one stat status, a lot of schools are school wide projects. So does that mean that every student in that school would have the title one status then even if they were not free or reduced or how, do, how does that work? Yeah, that that's a fantastic question and I want to preview for everyone on this call. That will be something that we are also going to put as a policy consideration and those are kind of the definitions component for the um, poverty and concentrated poverty weights. One of there are a couple of challenges um, and, and uh, a lot of you on this call know the state moved from what we call free and reduced price lunch and that was when everyone had to fill out the papers and we make income determinations, etc. And a lot of districts have moved to what we call CEP or community eligibility provisions where it is more by census and region um, than anything else. One of the that change was very recent and so one of the things we were trying to think about is when we define low income 
the direct certification is is kind of what we use now, and frankly, it is what we use now in the BEP. But with concentrated poverty, we recognize that as that proportional impact and multiplier at a school site. So for the purposes of the formula, if you have a title in the current definition that we're proposing and in this framework, um, if you are at a Title I school and you've got 200 students at that school, every one of those students would generate the weight for concentrated poverty because the school is such that the multiplier effect impacts every child at that school. That is also one of the ways in which we can support some of the concerns that you just brought up around direct cert that the working poor, so to speak, that they might not be counted in direct cert. Those are the kids we would previously have said would be qualified for reduced price lunch. Um, they would we would still see that kind of uh, counteracted within the concentrated poverty. Those are also things that are third party uh, verifiable. That is one of the requests that we've received um, directly is that anything where a child receives a weight, there is some kind of legal certification or document that goes with that. Similar to an IEP with a student with a disability, enrollment at a Title I school would be a very clear way we could document that. Um, direct certification is a very clear way we could document that, et cetera. So, that's a little bit of the thinking there. Really encourage additional feedback, um, and we'll put that in the policy document that you'll see on Friday. That's how we, how do we want to do this? How do we verify that? What is the most efficient and clear and fair way to do that? But I appreciate that question very much. It's something we've obviously um, talked a lot about uh, internally in terms of how we how we uh, move forward with both of those poverty concentrated poverty definitions. Uh, Commissioner. Yes, sir. It's Cato Johnson in Memphis. Hello. Uh, thank you. How you doing? Doing all right. Thank you for addressing that issue because one of the major discussions that we've had in my committee has been on the issue of concentrated poverty. And when you think of an area like this where over 80% of your kids qualify for free and reduced lunch programs, and in one area you have that, in another area you have the working poor, I'm glad you laid some clarification out about that particular issue. And I look forward to the policy discussions uh, surrounding that. So thank you for bringing up that issue. Yes, sir. Thank you. Commissioner, if I may, uh, yes. on page three. Yep. Looking at 504 dyslexia plans. So only yep. dyslexia, not all 504 plans. That's correct. Um, I think the feedback was more about dyslexia. That's the kind of the feedback we've received from the public. And one of the challenges that we're hoping to address is how do we determine the qualifications there? And so there is um, students with dyslexia who have an IEP. They would continue to receive that weight and support in their IEP. Then there are students with dyslexia that um, right now, some have Section 504 plans and some don't. For those on the call for the ed jargon part, Section 504 is any kind of accommodation. It's not necessarily an IEP with students with disabilities. A child in a wheelchair might have a Section 504. It's a legal requirement for an accommodation to meet the needs of a student. And so uh, for those students with dyslexia who don't qualify for special education, but still require services, the Section 504 plan is the legal document that can then trigger the funding. And again, it's that, it's that um, kind of more of the, the operational side of a formula where we have to be able to verify the numbers to generate the funds for you. And so I know a lot of districts right now, some of y'all do section 504s for your students with dyslexia. Some of you just provide the services um, and it, it goes both ways on that. This would essentially say this is the mechanism that would identify that a student has dyslexia and then generate the appropriate funding or weight accordingly. Also on page three, the college career and technical education. Mm -hmm. Would that be all funding for college career and technical education would be direct funding or would there be some in a base and, and then an additional funding? Yep, great question. So because the, how the BEP works now, as you all know, is that the student who who has the um, is participating or qualifies for that CTE funding is part of those ratio conversations because the base applies to all students. We might have a kindergarten student who does not generate that CTE weight because it's not in ratios. So we have that as a direct funding. So any student who is in a CTE program would generate a certain dollar amount that would be attributed to that student. 
one of the things that we'll talk about and you'll see that in the policy proposals that we'll send over is how we think about that. Um, it pulls out any funding that you might need for your staffing, your equipment, high value, high demand versus um, other programs, et cetera. But all of that amount would be attributed to the student as a direct dollar amount for any student who's in a CTE program in the state. Thank you. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let some others ask, ask questions and I'll circle around. I, I see you, uh, Commissioner Turner. I see a hand raised there. Yeah, hey, Commissioner Schwinn, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to just kind of touch on that. It was perfect timing. Okay. Uh, in my subcommittee, we get asked probably all the time, Ginger's in there with me, obviously. Uh, dyslexia comes up and it's close to the number one topic that gets brought up in our subcommittee. So thank you for working to address that. The second part of that statement that I want to just continue to encourage you and others on the on this group to do is uh, I get feedback all the time about concerns about whether or not the state of Tennessee is legally providing what's afforded as a right to a student with disabilities through 504s or through their IEPs or whatever that looks like. Just continue to drive that point home that that's a driver in our conversations is to make sure that we're legally meeting the requirements because I get emails uh, from stakeholders and from some of the subcommittee members. Uh, not that they're saying that Tennessee's not doing that, but they're always pushing that as if it's something that you guys are forgetting. And I know we're not, but I don't have the understanding or the background to be able to address it in a manner uh, that I think meets their needs sometimes. So if you have resources to point me and other chairs to, I'd love to see it, but also continue from your seat kind of as the chair or the commissioner of education to keep driving that point home that the state of Tennessee is using that as a driver in these conversations. And it's not an afterthought of if we get it great, if we don't, then we're not going to worry about because nobody will sue us. I just wanted to make sure I brought that up because that is feedback that I'm getting. I, I really appreciate that, uh, Commissioner. And I think that is one of the things that would be a one of the bigger shifts in terms of special education. So um, for the BEP right now, as you all have reviewed, it is a ratio when you look at let's say an level 10 is 8.5 students for every one educator. And then that's that's based on a number of things. Oftentimes it's service hours, et cetera. Ideally in a student based funding formula, it is about the cost of the service and we're tying that a little bit tighter um, so that students who might be in residential facilities, we're not generating that funding based on a staffing ratio. We're actually generating that based on the cost of a student requiring residential facility supports. And so that's part of, I think, the language. You'll see that a little bit in um, some, it, as we move forward and assuming we continue to move forward, um, that we'll start to really define what that looks like. The same thing I would say for English learners. Um, right now we have that same ratio based system in a student based system. We're able to really incorporate the feedback we heard that says a child who is very close to English language proficiency should generate a different amount than a child who has no English proficiency and maybe has not had access to formal schooling up until that point. They require very different services and supports and a, and a smart and strategic formula should consider that um, appropriately and, and, and fund those students in, in the ways that they need in order to each be successful. So I, I very much appreciate um, that push and that the committees will continue to talk about that. Other questions, either process, um, questions on the document itself, um, things that I, I'm happy to answer anything that's coming up for you. I know we've got a couple of big weeks coming up um, and, and I am also hopeful that the things that you are talking about in your subcommittees that you see a lot of that reflected in this document um, and have some more work to build on there, um, but but certainly hoping that you see that reflected. It's been it's been really good to to watch and listen to what y'all are doing. Commissioner, a couple of things sure. on page four. Yes, sir. Uh, Overall salaries, thank you and and all the other committees for realizing that there's lots of other employees in, in school systems besides just teachers that are important to the to the success of our operation. My question here on this page is under the uh, transparency, accountability and reporting. Yep. Will this be something that the reporting will take place at the state level or this will be another report that we'll have to be responsible for at the district level. Um, yep, so right now districts are currently responsible for this reporting to the federal government. 
Uh, we've gotten a, um, it, it's football uh, playoff season, so apologies, but uh, we got a buy um, for the last couple of years because of the pandemic. So the reporting has not been, uh, we haven't had the scrutiny um, as as we um, expect to have in future years. And, and um, the superintendents on this call know that we just had a joy talking about ESSER reporting and everything going along with that. So um, the expectation from the federal government at this time is that districts report at the school level all of your financial information that is that is a federal expectation so what this formula would do is it main it maintains our requirement to do that from a federal perspective it does make it a lot more streamlined because you don't have to break apart how much money was generated by students how much that school generated and then how you spend it because the money is generated at the student level it makes it a lot easier for you to report as opposed to trying to break down how our state formula works now so ideally this will save you time on those future reports that you are federally required to submit um, starting this school year so um, hopefully that will be helpful i think one of the things if this moved forward and if this was um, considered and approved by the general assembly one of the things that we would want to get district feedback on and build out is what is the most streamlined, efficient, and time uh, minimizing way in which those reports can happen? And that will most likely be how the state would generate the data for you. That would go into an automatic template and it's more about verifying than it is about generating that at the local level. That would be something of a strong commitment I would wanna make to all of you in, in districts. That would be greatly appreciated uh, if we could do something more along those lines, but uh... I guess one thing here with, I understand the transparent, transparency, the accountability, and every time there's been an infusion of money into education funding through the years, there's been additional accountability tied to that. And I understand that. But we're getting down to, it's almost, I guess reading some of this, it's almost that we're going to report this out there and the choices that some districts make do we see that kind of driving us away from a funding formula not a spending plan to potentially getting into a more de narrow definition just... i don't see that at all i think one of the the primary kind of components um of of this and i uh, i'm going to just triple check if, if it's up there or not yeah so on the on that first page the what must be there and some of these things are different some of these things are the same from the bep but that last one is that flexibility this does need to remain a funding plan not a spending plan now i will say you all have probably seen in the feedback coming in in public comment a lot of the things that people are requesting are actually not things you explicitly list out in a in a funding formula but they are things that you all would make choices to spend money on at the district level and i would say professional development is a great example of that we might consider professional development and say okay let's make sure there is funding for that but how districts choose to spend it and whether or not they even spend it on professional development that is absolutely a local decision and all of your local districts um, and we know 147 very different districts, you all have very different needs in terms of the amount of time, your staffing, what you want to spend money on versus what you can just generate with existing staff, et cetera. So I do not at all see us moving into a spending plan. I don't think that's the direction. I don't think that's the momentum of the state and that isn't best practice. Thank you. Yes, sir. I do wanna add there, cause I, I don't wanna, I, I just realized I don't wanna kind of Feel like it's hide the bunny a little bit but the um the reporting the transparency on that that is a different conversation so you have you would have full autonomy about how you spend the money i think the federal requirement and then the commensurate state requirements are just that it's publicly available so people know and are aware that decision making is absolutely the flexibility that lives in in local districts i just i want to make sure i was i don't think i was as clear as i should have been on that thank you yes sir Great questions. Other questions, concerns, things you're excited about, things that are coming up. I want to make sure you have um, everything that that you need um, to be able to facilitate this next round of, of kind of final draft recommendations. Um, and then I've got one thing I want to make sure I bring up that I'm going to ask for special feedback um, and focus on for for the next meeting that we need some help on. I would just like to add that the transparency was real. And I was truly excited to see this report and how it reflects what my committee actually recommended. And I think they're going to be really excited to see 
uh, the draft in proposal. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Could you offer just some more information about you mentioned at the top of the call uh, policy recommendations uh, or suggestions on policy? What's the timeline for when you're sending those? And can you just give us a little bit of a heads up of what to be uh, ready for? Thanks. Yes, sir. So, yeah, that's a great question. So, I think there's three buckets of policy recommendation recommendations we'd like feedback on. The first is what I would call definitions, and some examples of that are things that we talked about with, you know, poverty, concentrated poverty. The one that I want to flag that I just um, had kind of highlighted was rurality. I think we've had a lot of different ways to think about that, and I want to make sure that as a state, we define what rural is in Tennessee. Um, and that is might be different than how it is defined elsewhere. Some states define that by the size of the districts. And I was like, well, that's district size, that's not rurality. Some people look at students per square mile, some look at distance from a city center. And so we wanna say, here's how different folks have defined rurality versus sparsity and come up with what we believe is the right definition. Um, so definitions is kind of that first bucket. The second bucket is um, looking at any policy considerations um, that we might want to look at. An example, I think we sent a couple, um, I'll pull out Texas and Maryland because those are coming to mind, but we talk a lot about salaries. And so are there any policies that we would want to put forward in a proposal as a group of subcommittee members related to, we have to make sure that a certain percentage of increases year over year go towards salaries of existing staff. So we want to make sure that we have a minimum salary consideration um, that is within kind of budgetary constraints. Like what are the things that you would wanna look at from a funding perspective um, that would be important? Um, and then the third is on outcomes. And that's the one I'm asking for extra special feedback on. Uh, we wanna, we, we've gotten so much feedback and good feedback on outcomes. The list has gotten quite long um, and we are, we do have a budget. Um, it is not a, an unlimited uh, kind of space, no matter what, what happens, um, whether that's the BEP or a new formula. And I think we wanna make sure we're really clear and tight on outcomes that are prioritized for what we believe is most important to move student achievement forward. Um, and so any feedback you have on these are the things that we think are most important to provide outcome funding for. Um, we are in a place, and you saw this in the draft, to say we are split 50-50 in the state about whether it should be all kids or just um, prioritize student groups. The proposal we put together was to try to accommodate both of those perspectives and say it is all students, but the outcome weight would be just a little bit more for low-income students with disabilities and English learners. Um, but but uh, do we want JROTC? Do we want FAFSA completion, uh, CTE? All of those things, I think, extra special policy consideration there. And the other kind of extra, extra special that I'm asking for is on third grade uh, reading. That is something I think I said a couple meetings ago, steering committee was very, very clear about on the outcome section, but specifically on third grade reading. Literacy has been a major focus in the state now, um, especially coming off of last year's special session. Kudos, our districts have made incredible progress and done monumental work over the last 12 months as they have in the months before that. I think there's a real desire to want to reward and incentivize that continued work. It is really hard to figure out the best way to measure it. What you, it was a um, expert, rec, you uh, requested expert recommendations from that uh, four weeks ago. Uh, what you will get in your inbox that is going to be publicly posted is a draft memo um, from uh, from Education Commission of the States, that nonpartisan group that essentially outlines here is what different states have done in outcomes. So you will be able to see exactly what that is. Again, that will be provided in writing. It will also be posted on the website. But that's that third policy bucket is just how do we treat outcomes in the state? What do we want and how do why do we think it matters for kids? I'm going to give a little bit of a nod to the rurality conversation. So even if you are in an urban suburban, I don't care what subcommittee you are, it is a really important definition. And that is because the number of kids it impacts swings wildly depending on that definition. And so you will see three options. Option one is students per square mile. Right now, the, the definition um, federally is 10. Um, I think I have seen some states go up to 25. Other option is uh, district size, which is not rurality or sparsity. Um, so, but I want to call that out. Should that be considered or factored into it at all? 
And the third consideration is what we call the NCES definitions. I believe those were sent out to you. That is that um, the fun, fun ways in which we talk about that, which is rural, remote, fringe, um, et cetera, versus town, versus suburban, versus urban. So I think those are um, getting a tight definition with a rationale is going to be one of the most important definitions we do. So just wanted a little plug for that, not just on the rural community, but for everybody. <laughs> Other questions, comments, things that um, you're excited about, not excited about, anything we can address or we think we want to talk about as a group. Uh, let's, we're moving. Commissioner, just yes, one thing from our meetings with our local funding bodies and everything presented mm -hmm. that the formula would be possibly considered by the legislature and approved this year spend a year talking on the local contribution so in reality what would we potentially be a target if a new formula is approved this legislative session when would it go into effect fantastic question thank you for that director sarns so i think two things one is we we have 50 50 feedback on this which is always the hardest because there's no majority rules here but 50 percent of the feedback we've received has said just do it now. We want all of it done at the same time. 50% of the feedback said, well, if you're going, if there was a proposal and if there was more money put in, we kind of want to know what that is before we commit to what the local contribution would be. So we'll take the year and figure out what the new state funding formula might look like. And then we would want to spend a year understanding and providing feedback on what that means for the local contribution. So we've, we're split there. I think that's important for us to continue to get feedback on. Now, from a timeline perspective, if the governor uh, proposed legislation and a budget, and if the General Assembly um, approved that and, and voted in favor of it, what we would want to do is say from that moment for the next 14 plus months, so whatever the next school year is, all of that would be transition time. That would give time for professional development, for building tools and resources, um, providing additional capacity for local districts, communication, all of those things would happen for the entirety of the 22-23 school year. So that the first time that this new formula would go into effect would be in the 23-24 school year. Again, I think um, want to make sure if this moved forward that you all would have plenty of time and everyone on this call would have plenty of time to deeply understand it and how you can make decisions to maximize um, the best kind of impact and use of those funds uh, before it would go into effect. We wouldn't want to give you two months and say good luck, right? We want to make sure that there's a lot of time for that. Um, and certainly there's some additional supports that the department would would provide if that moved forward um, to, to help with those transition efforts. Thank you. Yes, sir. Commissioner, along with that comment uh, and question, is there any thought been put into um, the, the, is there going to be an actual real time or are the numbers going to be collected ADM by that year or the previous year, uh, first semester, second semester, or continuing to wait by months like we're doing now? That's a great question. So uh, we will be asking that. I think that is a question we are going to target to uh, local districts and superintendents specifically because it is, as, as you all know, um, very much in the technical weeds of things that people don't live and breathe every day. But I think generally speaking, we know there's a bigger conversation about do we collect it every month? Do we continue to do um, specific months that we're focusing on? Are we funding for existing year or prior year? What I do think in terms of initial feedback has been People want the predictability and they want to know how much money they have so they can budget accordingly. So my sense is that we would still at this point, the initial proposal would look at prior year so we can say a for, like for sure this is how much money you would be getting. I do think that from a because the money is attached to the student, there is more of an interest of having really good clean data for every single month so that you all would generate the exact amount and not get so so called shorted. Um, and I know that's been a, um, a particular point of feedback that we've received lately. So um, we'll go with you all um, and, and kind of have a separate conversation um, that will and ask for that feedback to be sent directly to the department for for public review, of course. But we know you all are very, very um, in tune with that particular policy decision. <laughs> Uh, 
other questions, um, comments, things that, that you want to make sure we talk about today, um, I would just again encourage in that district specific fund um, line item, it's in the base and it's called district specific needs. If there are things in your subcommittees that um, aren't on those bullets, but you think, you know, I don't know if this is for everybody, but some people might want it. If you want to go ahead and just tag it as it could go in that district specific needs component, those would be dollars set aside. Again, no spending plan, but we want to make sure we would be funding and understanding what the total need might be in that space. Um, and the example I will always use is not every school in the state under the BEP gets a principal. Some schools only get half a principal because they don't meet the ratio threshold. So that was something that a couple of our rural districts, it's 300 schools almost, um, really, really need. But you might look at Metro Nashville or um, I see you, Director Week. So maybe Dixon, you know, Dixon County. You might not have that same need, but you have different needs. And we would want to make sure that we're still being, um, we're not being so one size fits all that we don't account for the information needed between districts. So that's what that bullet's really trying to get at. Would that bullet also address potentially school resource officers, or yes. is that? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, it would school resource officers. Some districts have said they want it. Some said they they haven't. They want to do school hardening uh, facilities. Um, different people have different deferred maintenance needs, etc. That would kind of be in that chunk. And as a reminder, everything that is funded in the BEP, not necessarily the we're not doing the ratios. It's the student level amounts. But if it was funded in current education funding, that nothing would be left out of any existing proposed formula. So the school safety money, coordinated school health those things that live either inside or outside of the BEP would all be part of this kind of this base package. All right. Well, you all know how to find me. Um, I, I apologize. I'm seeing the same uh, nine faces as I usually do. So a special shout out to uh, the three directors, Yolanda, Ginger, Dan, um, Elizabeth, our student chair, who has been knocking it out of the park, Dominique, and then uh, Nancy and Scott. So I've seen your faces the entire time. I always appreciate the friendliness um, with whoever whoever I am looking at. Um, but I just want to say again, it's it's been really neat to see how you all have come together on this. Um, I hope you're watching each other's and, and seeing kind of those conversations unfold or looking at the recommendations. We've got a lot of really smart strategic student focused people in the state and being able to highlight that work has been one of the great joys um, that I've been able to have in this process. And so thank you very much for everything you're doing. Um, you know how to get in touch with me, please do and continue the, the good hard work. I think we are making progress and getting momentum. So it's, it's good news for 22. Optimistic about the year. All right. Thank we'll you, talk to Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye.